Alrighty. Phase three and four of the French Revolution. Wall of text incoming. So what can we look at with the third? Uh, hello. Hang on. There we go. Matt playing the animation. Let's do it. Yes, yes. Now, I've already taken the liberty of putting all of this over here. Excepting this part right here. We'll talk about that. But basically, this is about the changes we see occur because of the third phase. Let's look at the third phase. The third phase is in response to the radical second phase, the reign of terror. So it's moderate. They set up a new government that's called the Directory. The Directory has five guys instead of making delicious hamburgers, making laws. And they also have a bicameral legislature. Bicameral meaning two house. I actually never think about it. I didn't actually write any of that down, did I? That's all the second slide. That's okay. I can slide it out of order. So, we have third phase. As we established, it is going to be moderate. They set up the directory. going to fail. I'll we'll leave to why here and get to the goal. But the other important thing about the third phase is the role of women. Women. Participants in the revolution. <laughs> they do this in a lot of different ways. You might remember, for instance, the fish ladies mentioned in the video, or the women's bread market, the guys who, the ladies who actually went to the palace and forced the king and queen to come back and almost like killed the queen right then and there. So they were very much involved, even so, uh, they were not given the same rights and privileges that other people were. They were largely ignored. banned from having political clubs. It's too much effort whenever I have a three-year-old. She's gonna be piggy. I got a picture on Facebook. A piggy. Little piglet. But these two ladies, Olivia de Gouge and Jean Roland, are executed because they refuse to not form political clubs. They were fighting for their rights, including the right to vote. Ultimately, this is what was seen as necessary for women to gain the ability to actually affect their own lives. You know, the ability to vote. There would be a powerful voting bloc, and basically it shut down. And 
What's fascinating about this is the reasonings are some reasonings I've still heard used today. I have met people who say that women should not be allowed to be in positions of leadership because they are too emotionally weak to handle the responsibility. And by the way, I'm hearing this from women. So this is something that, you know, is still very much a part of our society. We've got a lot of stuff, we're gonna change it, you know? But I digress. So they are banned from political clubs, even though um, they fought so hard for the revolution. This is going to be a big sticking point later on. It's like, hey, where's our freedoms? You know, where's the promises that we were supposed to have? And as we're going to see, uh, there's going to be some, some pretty big changes that happen because of this. So, ultimately, as we've established, there's going to be a period of change that goes along with this period of the French Revolution. And there's going to be some distinct changes in society. That's hilarious. Now you guys get it, right? You get it? Yeah. You try to do the middle class. Sometimes. Never you mind. Yes. Where's Napoleon from? Of course it comes. C O R S I C K. And we'll talk about him here in just a moment. So here's the change. First of all, let's talk about this. You guys might remember the song Culot, or song Culot as it's going to be pronounced. Does that ring a bell? No, not really? Interesting. Um, anybody? No one knows it at all. You've never heard that term in your life. Culotte. C U L O T T E. Sans culotte. Sans culotte referred to. Uh, culottes were knee brooches, knee pants, pants that were popular with the aristocracy. These were folks saying, We're too poor to afford the noble fashion. We're the everyday citizen. It was a political group in the uh, French Revolution, really kind of from the beginning. But they symbolize a shift in fashion from the aristocratic style of dress to more middle class dress, going to trousers instead of knee bridges, different style of coats and hats. This was what was becoming popular because you didn't want to be associated with nobility. In addition, the calendar in order to weaken the church was made non-secular, or based not on the church. So basically, the church is losing more and more of its power and, and presence in the, uh, in, in the government. Also, for fear of slavery becoming an issue, it was abolished. And finally, the style of art that became very popular during this era is what we consider neoclassical. Louis David is the de facto um, painter of the French Revolution. His styles, his works are famous during this era. One of them you saw on the video yesterday was the depiction of the death of Marat. Remember the guy in the bathtub who's ruled by Jesus? Okay. Well, he's also famous for many of the paintings we have of Napoleon. Probably one of his most famous ones is this right here. Now, again, if you want to see something reinforcing the attitude of a uh, Roman-esque style of painting and art, this, this is it. Uh, the Romans were famous for the depictions of soldiers and generals on horseback. They're called Westerns. In particular, this very dramatic pose of the horse rearing and his hand coming forward, leading his head almost like this claw. Is challenging everything in front of him. The scene depicted is when Napoleon led his armies over the Alps to attack Italy. Now, here's the thing about the Alps. The Alps were a natural barrier, not just for men, also for women, weather patterns. And so it was a formidable defense. 
And there's been a few famous instances of people leading armies over the Alps. And you'll notice, if you look down here in the corner, you've got their names listed right there. Charlemagne, Hannibal, and above them, Bonaparte. So he's claiming in this work that Bonaparte is the greatest of them all. Now, in addition, this very sort of dramatic uh, officer's uniform and this very well-styled hair. In this era, the hairstyle that we see is popular on men's base, but that's why I describe it as like motorcycle. You know, it's like hair, it's all like wind blown with the floor, it's all curly and sort of busy. Well, this was, you know, hot stuff during this era. And again, this dramatic scene was what we see very popular in this era. It's going to give rise to an era of, of romanticism, is the style of art in the early part of the 19th century. Romanticism, or romantic art, is a style where you try to portray emotions. You know, you want powerful scenes, whether it be projecting love, or hate, or heroism, any kind of subject matter you can do, but it's got to be big. It's go big or go home. You want something that's going to get us into it. We can see the motions here. You see something like this, it's like, yeah, get on your bad horse. So it's exciting. And this is the style we're going to see with Blue's V in all of his works. It's all about drama, if that makes any sense. Generally, it also has a a, a favorable opinion of nature, but that's something else. Right, so Napoleon is initially born on an island called Corsica. So he is technically noble, but he's poor. Uh, he is not the inheritor. There's nothing for him to inherit. So if you're a noble blood and you don't have any money to inherit, you got to find a job somewhere. So the question is, what job are you going to do? Well, he decides to settle on the military. By he, I mean his parents. He is sent to military school, if you don't guess. And there, he turns out he's actually really good at it. He's a master of using artillery. You guys know the word artillery means? It's cannons and, and mortars and the big stuff, yeah? Power you know? That's his sort of strength. That's going to be important later. The other thing is, he's actually a genius. Like we say, like, oh, that person's a genius for creating this thing or whatever. Yeah. The person who created fun yet, genius. Yeah. In case it was colored sugar in a pouch. But in truth, let's be honest, what does the word genius actually mean? Like, we say it all the time, but what does it mean? I mean, okay, they're smart. How smart? What is smart? Well, genuinely speaking, we're going to look at it from the standpoint of mental processes, like how much, how many plates can you get spinning and keep track of everything, you know? How far ahead can you think of people? How can you uh, think around people, that sort of thing? He was an exceptional thinker. Um, he would write seven letters to seven different people at the same time, basically holding seven different conversations at simultaneously. Because he didn't write his own letters. He had other people write them for him, like secretaries. So he would be dictating it. So like, you'd be writing one letter, and he'd be like, you know, all right, you're writing this to this person, things like, they okay, were having a conversation. And by the way, you're writing this over here while this is going on. You keep writing on this part right here. And this, you, would you please write this part? And he's just going like that 100 miles an hour. He also was very good at manipulating people. Um, for instance, in one battle, uh, I'll be able to say, he had the high grounds. And the high ground is what you always wanted in war for a couple of reasons. You know, the high ground gives you an advantage because you don't have to slog up this mountain, hill or mountain or whatever while you're attacking somebody. So they, they just kind of sit there while you're smelling all your energy walking into this hill. And if it's raining, it's going against you. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're the attacker, if you're the defender, you just kind of sit there and like, watch him blow away. Uh, if you actually shoot a gun downhill, you don't have to worry so much about the gravity throwing off your shots. You're a little bit more accurate. There's all kinds of reasons you want the high ground. Right? He gave up the high ground. The only reason you do that in war in 1812, 1914, is if you are running away, you're surrendering. 
So the Polish are like, awesome, he's serenity. So they charge up the hill, yeah, we got the high ground now. And then he wheels up the chains. Got you! And that's when he So I mean, it's one of those things that he's very good at playing people. And what's really crazy about him is he would be like losing battles and like losing the war. He'd be like, aha, now I've got you. And they're like, crap, he's got me. And you're like, I'll stop attacking you if you give me this area of land. You're like, fine, whatever. Just whatever you're about to do, don't do it. It was total BS. He's made it up. He was really good at manipulating people and turning even his losses into victories. He was also incredibly inspirational. I don't know, you guys will meet people in your lives who just, for whatever reason, they're just charismatic or whatever, and just they're inspiring. Like when you're around that type of person, you want to be better than you are because you want to impress them. You want to kind of have their approval, things like that. It's not that something that they're doing in particular, they're just charismatic people. That's Napoleon. You know, he was the type of person who could inspire anybody. He inspired the rabble of revolutionaries and people who were barely trained soldiers to go fight and win wars and do all this amazing stuff and become the most powerful nation on earth. That's kind of an important thing. He's also a narcissist. He loves Napoleon. And uh, to put this into perspective, when he becomes emperor, normally the pope will crown a king or an emperor and signifying that the church of God is granting you this privilege. You know, God is granting you the throne. And technically it's elevating the pope above you because the one giving the power is technically above the person who gets the power. It's sort of like the Aladdin genie thing. You know, Jafar is going to become a genie because the genie gave his power, but that actually, you know, it's, it's a whole rock paper scissors thing. Anyhow, so what happens is the Pope is lowering the crown of Napoleon's head. He anoints it out of the Pope's head, hands and puts it on his own head. He's like, ain't no Pope above me. So he's kind of a narcissist. Legend has it also he was short. Probably heard of that short. You know, not true. It's actually British propaganda. He was so intimidating. Uh, they had to make up lies about him to try to make him less intimidating. Otherwise, their soldiers just can't. He's like, no. He was five foot six. Which, short for us, but in 1812, 1814, that was the average height. He'd be like, today he'd be like six foot. You know what I mean? You wouldn't think of him shorter or taller, just normal, you know? That's saying, you know, it's, it was normal. But they made it wise to try to make it seem like, oh, he's a little tiny guy. So, like, oh, not true. Those are great lines, by the way. Like, there are still lies that they made up in World War II. People are like, yeah, it totally works. It's like the whole thing about carrots being good for your eyesight, not for the British made it up. The reason for that was that they had cracked the Enigma machine, the, prop, the, the, the code machine that the Nazis were using. And so the Battle of the Blitz, whenever the planes were coming at night, the British would always know where they were. And so they're like, how do the British know where we are all the time? The British cracked the code there. Okay, they're attacking here, send the squadron number, it's still good. So instead they're like, no, it's because the British get lots of carrots. See, carrots are good for your eyes. You can see them dark. True story. It's too dumb to make up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. By the way, that was one of those rants where probably just kept going on. I know, but I wanted to hear. Can you tell us more lies? I can tell you all kinds of lies. What's the lie about Halloween? What? Do you have any lies about Halloween? Any lies about Halloween? Um, I don't know. Things, yeah. Oh, I, I know a good lie about Halloween. So people said that uh, you should never accept homemade sweets because people were putting razor blades and things like that. Not sure it never happened. Someone actually, this is back in the lab as a kid. Uh, like they, they said, I don't remember this thing. Like, yeah, have your parents check. And actually they had hospitals that were like, okay, we've got the x-ray machine. Feel free to bring your kids candy and we'll x-ray it. Because they said there's no metal in it. Because allegedly people were putting razor blades and rewrapping it. It never happened. Yeah, you have to be a, a world class douchebag to do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, more hilarious would be something like putting like a red hot in the center of like a tootsie roll, because it would be unexpected. That's just pranking. So that's not like you know, you're not hurting them. Just like, ah, 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 you know. Yeah. Actually, one of the funniest pranks I've ever seen, the most simple one, is someone taking like clear plastic tape, putting it over a door. Oh, yeah. That's mine. That's it? That's mine. You see the one video where the person did it and had the bathroom, and the guy walks out in the face, 
And he's like, all right, now I'm going to do it again. He thinks he's going to be down me, but I think he had another door. So it was like the bathroom door here, and there was a hallway here, and then there was this guy's office right here. So he put it the tape here and here. So the guy comes out of the bathroom, he's like, you can't get me again, jerk. No! <laughs> 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 And that's kind of like the bullying because you're thinking around people. Anyway, back to the bullying. So he was so popular, right? He, 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 was, he was at all the kids, school kids' birthday party. Um, because, think about it, he's, he's defeating other armies. He's successful. And at a time when people are hungry and they're desperate and they're bad, you know, someone's like, I know you guys are having a bad day, but you know, we totally just conquered Egypt, so. And it's like, yes, we have something to be excited about. And so he uses this, because he's intelligent, to rise himself up to the position of ruler of France. And he does it slowly. He uses his popularity by Cleveland's side. Cleveland's side is a simple yes or no vote. He would have votes be like, all right, how many guys think that I should be in the government? They're like, yeah, we want Napoleon. He's awesome. He's doing all these awesome things. What's cool is, all these members of the uh, directory uh, were like, yeah, get Napoleon up here. We can control him. Ain't no one control Napoleon but Napoleon. So they were thinking, yeah, we'll get him in the position of power. We're going to be like behind the scenes. It's like, cool story, bro. Hey, how many guys think I should get rid of the directory? Yes, yes, I want, I want, I want that. Me, 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 me. Fantastic. Goodbye. Now we have triumphant. And uh, I'll be the first consul. It's like the dude in charge. Uh, how do you are cool with that? Woo, woo, me, me, me. Fantastic. And probably just get rid of it. We'll just make me, you know, first console for life. Awesome. How about Emperor? <laughs> Yay! And this is how he rose to power. That's seriously how he did it. The people love Napoleon. He's hated all around the world, but he did, you know, kind of conquer it. So it's, we tend to frown on that. There's only two places in Europe he didn't conquer. Russia and England. England's an island, Russia's cold. And big. And the fact is, Napoleon wasn't really so much defeated by Russia, it's that he got there and they refused to fight him. When he invades Russia, the Russians are like, nope. So Napoleon's like, well, I'm going to take over St. Petersburg. It's like, cool, have at it. I'm going to take over your capital. You just kind of found it. Yeah, whatever. We'll set it on fire. Seriously, yeah. It's called, it's, it's called Scorched Earth. The point is, we're going to take this over. Okay. See ya. Anything that was usable for the army, burned it. Food, burned it. Cows, burned them. <laughs> and would have killed them first, you know. Steak dinner. Beef, it's left for dinner. Water, burned it. Now, this is just getting ridiculous. How did he do this? No, no, no. They, they burned everything so that they couldn't use it as they were coming along with their armies. So Napoleon gets to St. Petersburg, winter starts setting in, it's like, uh oh, we don't have food, we don't have coats, we don't have anything, and the army's just ignoring us. It's an utter disaster. That's what defeats Napoleon. It's the winter. Russian winters are horrible. Like we're talking negative 70 degrees. That sounds lovely. Now consider this for just a second, because people are all like, you know, I, I see you guys out there doing the, the, the fire drill, you're like, it's a bit cold. It's like what, like 65? All right? 65 degrees. So this is, you know, 100 degrees colder. That's, that's like cold beyond like our capacity to understand. You know? I mean, people are freezing to death. Little icicles. That's lovely. Yeah, right? So this is a blunder. It's a mistake. And he pays for it. But before we get there, let's talk about what he does that's awesome. So he takes over the government through the political side, through popularity contest. And it works. Good for him. So what does he do? He changes everything. One of his best, biggest, most important contributions is called the Napoleonic Code, or the Code Napoleon, however you want to look It's a system of laws that is based on enlightenment principles that gets rid of the entire old system. Now, it is kind of one of those instances of two steps forward, one step back, because he basically revokes any privileges granted to women. They basically become property of her husbands. So, step back. However, all men are granted the right to vote. 
and representation of the government. It is very specific as to how punishments are done and things like that. It is sensible, it works. And basically, it is one of the most widespread laws in the world. Like, more people have based their country's laws off the Code Napoleon than anything else. So it's kind of a big deal. So there's going to be some pretty big changes because of Napoleon. Now, I like to show this picture. It's, again, a Louis David. But the reason for this picture is there's a famous picture he does. It's the last picture of Napoleon. After he's been defeated for the second time, when he's just kind of old and fat and bald and kind of let himself go, he's just sitting there looking tired at a desk. It's like, I show pictures like that. It's like, this is an inspiring general. That's like, dude looks like a fat old guy. And he's sitting like sitting in Waffle House. That's not very inspiring. So let's look at this picture instead. This is when he was young. Again, I like the Regency hair. This, 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 you know, because this was, this is the look you were going for. Man. This is, this is how you want to be. And this black uniform, just standing out, you know, this, this dramatic scene. This guy with a sword and a flag in his hand. He's like looking over his shoulder. He's like, oh, what? I'm at the front of an army. What up? You know, casual hair. All this gold embroidering and the big sash and everything's by, you know. By the way, this is a military uniform. I love the military uniforms in the Napoleonic era because they are utterly ridiculous. When you think about the military uniform today, like the combat uniform, you got like, you know, you got the, uh, the camouflage bags, things like that. These guys are like, I want a hat that's got a 15 foot feather on it. That'd be fantastic. You know? Probably the best uniform that Napoleon ever had was for his personal guard. And what, what I may have told you this before, but it's, it's just so like amazingly crazy. Is so it was, it was pants that were embroidered buckskin. So it had all these like elaborate designs in it, and it was this you know supple leather and these big, basically calf high boots that went to course a shirt with a red waistcoat with this giant red cravat and a coat slung over that had all these uh, embroidered designs and everything on it this sort of like uh, these patterns that with these really elaborate buttons and then a second coat that was the same but just it was slung over the shoulder and lashed to the sides with chains and a crushed purple velvet cape or excuse me the lining was crushed purple velvet. The cape itself was leopard skin. And it had a helmet that was winged with two giant peacock feathers that hung down to the small of the back. <laughs> it was pretty crazy looking. And by the way, whenever he was done with that, he his thing is Napoleon also like basically played dress up with his personal guard. They got like a uniform every three months. So he would sell the military surplus so the places well the army of the united states the u.s army bought those uniforms they became the uniform of the uh rhode island lancers so that was the u.s army military the military uniform at one point talk about style yes ma'am well that is true however i will say this uh, it helps whenever you're actually in the situation. The, the, the style of the Hussars, these were guys on horseback. They were heavy cavalry. They were not dudes you want to tangle. They had a reputation for being brutal fighters and basically short of temper. It's like you insult them, they're just going to kill you. Sort of people. These were not people you want to mess around with. So the, the Hussar coat, the one that was talking about the sling out way, that was a symbol of don't mess with me. You know? And you <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Any old Um Let me show you a video real quick. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pause the recording because I don't know what it's going to look like if I do that. Instant. Um, that's better. Hey, that's me. Yeah. Now, that was a, that, was, I, that guy was particularly weird because like my entire company died. It was just me and a lieutenant, 
And so like, I ended up picking up with his, the officers didn't carry guns, they carried swords. But the whole point of the sword is basically to uh, kill anybody who tries to run away. It's like if you're someone in your back line starts trying to run away, you're not telling them to run away, you just chop them down. Like, yeah, who else wants some? Uh, the whole point of the officers was everyone else is supposed to be more afraid of you than they are of the enemy. So that's the sword. Where was that at? That was at Mississippi while in Marion, Indiana. Yeah. It's not really you ask, you, you sign up for it. And put in a registration, you have to read that for the policy. So it's done for years. Anyway, it's an experience. But yeah. So I just saw one guy who pulled the trigger and his gun didn't go off. That does happen a lot. It's like crap. But you know, but, you know yeah, the uniforms look a little ridiculous, but at the same time, when the gunfire is going and the swords are drawn and everything, it's like. There's all styles. So, so what are his policies? What makes Napoleon popular? First of all, economic growth. He returns the emigrants. He promotes religious tolerance. He grants land to peasants. He has the Napoleonic code. What's not the love? I mean, he does all this crazy stuff because he is decisive. People are like, well, I think we should actually do this. No, moving on. Huh? You know, he just, he was a force of, of nature. He did what he needed to do, and he was successful. And what's funny is his, his policy of economic reform basically was don't meddle with it. That means the thing. So ultimately, his successes are going to make him incredibly popular. And that's ultimately going to result in him having the position that he does. And he's going to be rather strong as a candidate for it. He turns his military loose on conquering most of Europe and makes them become part of what's known what as the continental system. Even when he flat out had territory to France, he made nations become part of his alliance. This is all going to come to a head when he tries to invade England and goes to war with England, and the United States gets drugged into it in the War of 1812. That's what that whole video was about to just watch. The War of 1812 is sort of the Napoleonic Wars that happened in America. And it was basically generally a giant disaster, and everyone pretends it doesn't happen because nobody wins. Like, you saw that part where they were talking about Washington, D.C. was occupied and burned by the British. Yeah, we also burned part of Canada. We controlled parts of Canada. They controlled part of the United States. At the end of it, everyone was very confused. We said, let's just give everything back and pretend it didn't happen. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, technically, if you're going to say England wins, uh, you could say the British won because Canada wasn't conquered by the United States, as we were trying to do. You could say that the United States won because we got Britain to stop instigating the Native Americans against us. Because the Native Americans lost the war because the territories they wanted to reclaim from the colonies, that never happened. In fact, we gained more territories than Native Americans. Whole tribes were slaughtered. So this is basically the end of any strong resistance from the Native Americans to the Americans that they pushed westward. So, like I said, it's a kind of forgotten war in our history, but they remember it in England, especially Canada. Like it's, Canada's real kind of like revolutionary war. For them it's huge. Not so much for us. That's a good thing. <laughs>